On this week's episode of A Drier Dose of Disney, Jared discusses wait times and if they are accurate or not. Welcome to another episode of A Dryer Dose of Disney. I'm your host, Jared Dreyer. And this week, we've got a topic that pretty much everyone has an opinion on, and that is wait times and whether or not they're accurate. So we're going to have a fun time today talking about how the parks utilize their wait time system, whether or not they're accurate. Are there any tips and tricks to how to either avoid long wait times or how to better interpret wait times? So we're going to be talking through all of that today. But before we get started, we do want to ask, hey, wherever you're listening to this podcast or if you're watching our video format on YouTube, please click that subscribe button. So that way you're alerted to when we drop new episodes every single week on Tuesdays. Second is Patreon. We obviously keep this podcast going through supporters such as yourself. So please support us over at Patreon, especially if you get a tip or trick that saves you some time or money and you think, man, that was valuable. That helped me out a ton. Go over to Patreon and help us out there with our Patreon. We actually have three different levels. All three levels actually do get access to our Butterbeer and our How to Go to Disney for Free episodes. So that's early access on those as well as any others that we may release in the future. But in addition to those, if you go to our other two levels, one of them is a contributor level where you're able to either ask questions or throw things out there that we will include on our next podcast episodes as we record those. And then our top level is somebody who's going to actually participate in our podcast. And what we mean by that is our intent is to host once a quarter or a couple times a year an episode where we actually bring on supporters through Patreon and we talk about what are their favorite things at the park, as well as what are their tips or tricks, or they can ask us some questions live. So great way to not only get your questions answered, especially specific ones, but for you to help keep this podcast going if you find value in it. We also, you can see behind me the uh, Tumblr back there, we have our I Can Do This All Day merchandise out there that is available on our Etsy shop at A Dryer Dose of Disney. You can link there either by going to Etsy and searching A Dryer Dose of Disney, or you can go to our Facebook page and we have links there or wherever you're listening or watching this podcast, we have links in the description below. So please go check that out and uh, start wearing that stuff around the parks. You're going to get a lot of cool comments. Uh, We do all the time, every time that we wear it. So lots of good merchandise out there, including not just cups and mugs and shirts and stuff, but we also have bags, backpacks, things that you can carry around the parks with you. So normally I like to share stories in all of our podcasts to relate to the topic. And this week we have way too many stories to share. I could share with you literally hundreds of times that either a wait time was too long or much shorter than what was advertised, which is what we're going to talk about today. But probably the one that stood out in my memory the most was during COVID. This was the fall of 2020. We went to Disneyland and they obviously were not doing the fast passes or lightning lane. In fact, they hadn't even rolled out lightning lane yet. And they were trying to get everything converted and started up for that. So every single parkour fell into the general queue, which actually I prefer. If you listen to our episode on Uh, Genie Plus, I talk about the fact that I prefer not having lightning lanes or not having a Genie Plus system. And the reason is I think that's more fair. I think the queues move much quicker and it's a much better place to be. Now, the problem is you have way too many people in the park. And what happens is if you don't have a lightning lane reservation or a fast pass reservation, then you feel like you are obligated to wait in a queue in order to ride the next ride that you want to ride versus maybe your next queue is going to be in 15 minutes with a lightning lane. You may instead go get something to eat or something to drink or go to a a store and go shopping before you go on that ride. So by actually having lightning lane and the express pass over at Universal, you're actually getting people out of the queues and out of the lines, which was their intent and their goal in doing that. So when you don't have those things there, then obviously the lines get much longer, but they, to my credit, move a lot quicker. So we were there at Disneyland and we went to go ride on the Haunted Mansion, which had been turned over to the Nightmare Before Christmas theme. And when we went around over there, the queue was extensive, not just outside of the gates of the Haunted Mansion, but it weaved back and forth in front of the train station over there, moving down towards the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. And if you're familiar with that, obviously, when Pirates of the Caribbean, the queue gets too long, 
they extend that out and they'll go up and over the bridge and back and forth a couple of times. So these queues were getting close to merging with one another because both rides were extremely backed up. Lots of people in the queuing at that point in time, but it was because there was no fast pass. There was no lightning lane available. So every single person had to wait in that line. Because of that, they had cast members out there holding signs up saying the line starts here and they had a timer on it. And on the top, uh, when we walked over to the Haunted Mansion, they said it was a 90 minute wait. And I thought to myself, there's no way I'm waiting 90 minutes for the Haunted Mansion. But you could see how quickly the queue was moving, that people were just literally walking through this queue. And I told my wife, I said, there's no way it's going to be 90 minutes. Look at how quickly everyone's moving. And without any fast pass or lightning lane, they're taking everyone into these elevators. And, and I think they take about 40 or 50 people per elevator. And they have two of them. So they're just loading this thing as quick as they can. So I told her, I think the wait time is going to be a lot shorter than what they're advertising. So sure enough, we got in line. We almost did not stop walking the entire time we were in line. There was a couple times when we got inside the gates that it stopped for a second or two. But we got all the way into the elevators within about 15 minutes. So a 90-minute advertised wait time was not accurate. In fact, not only inaccurate, it was grossly inaccurate. However, they were doing that because when you see an advertised wait time of 90 minutes, you're probably not going to get in line. Like we were thinking it wasn't worth our time. So we watched the queue for just a moment and then realized that it was probably going to be a little bit quicker. So there is definitely a psychological element of utilizing longer wait times to keep people from getting in line. So we're going to talk about that more here in just a second. But the wait times, are they accurate or are they not? Let's talk about how they first get the wait times. So if you go back in time, even a couple of years, you probably remember if you've been to the parks more than a couple of times that they would give out these little red plastic cards that would be on a lanyard and they would give them to you when you were entering the queue. And they'd say, please hold on to this until a cast member asks for it at the end of the queue. So you'd hold it all the way through the queue. And when you got up to the front and you were getting on the ride, the cast member would take it and they'd go scan it. And that told everybody how long you actually waited in line. And then they would update their signage accordingly. As you can imagine, that is, in hindsight, that is a lag result, not a lead indicator. So when you're thinking about, do I want to report the time? If you're reporting a 90-minute wait, you're reporting that at the end of the 90-minute wait. And now people behind that could be waiting much longer or much less, you know, if the line in the queue got shorter. So that was not the most efficient way to do it, but that's how they always did it. So that's across the board. They were doing that at Universal. They were doing that at Disney, at every single park. And I remember dozens of times being asked to carry that lanyard with that uh, red plastic card up to the front. Now they no longer do that. In fact, on our last trip out there, uh, my wife was asking, hey, when's the last time you saw them do that? And I had to really scratch my head there to think about how long ago it had been since I saw one of those. And I told her it's at least been a couple of years. And the reason is they now are utilizing the My Disney Experience on the app on the phone. When you go in there and you set up that app, you do enable location services. And that actually helps with your placement in the park. And then that way you can find out where you're at and what the wait times are around you. But it also gives them the ability to see who's in their park, how many people are in the park and in the different queues, and then how long it's taking you to get through those queues. So they're actually able to utilize this. And in fact, if you've been to the park recently and you use the My Disney Experience app, uh, whether at Disneyland or Disney World, you'll notice that after you ride a ride that has a uh, photo pass on it, so it took your picture during the ride, you may not stop to get that. But if you look at your photos later in the day, your photo is in there. And the reason is they are good enough now. They have identified when you're going in and out of the queues and they can pair it up real close to know exactly when uh, you were on that ride. And they know, hey, here's when the phone went through by the cameras and, and all that. And they will automatically upload those pictures to your phone. Cool technology, obviously a little bit big brother. I'm totally okay with it. I'm an early adopter of technology. I love all that kind of stuff. But it definitely gives them the opportunity to know how long you're waiting in the queues and how long the queues are getting because they can count how many people are out there. And then they can adjust the times from either some kind of central control or somewhere else. Now with that, though, they're getting a ton of data. So with that data, the, the wait times, the queue times are actually getting more and more accurate as we move forward in time, but they're not perfect. And there are some techniques that you can deploy to shorten your waits and to make your day a little bit more pleasant at the park. 
So a couple things to consider though, when you're thinking about that, first and foremost, rides at Disney, because it is different at Universal, but rides at Disney that have lightning lane are subject to be wrong more frequently than those that don't. And the reason is Disney gives reservations for lightning lane and in time periods for people to come back. And if they don't follow that, or they obviously they get a window, if they all come at the very beginning of their window, or they all come at the very end of their window, you can see how very quickly the crowd could stack up and almost multiply on top of itself because of the lightning lane users and how they didn't spread themselves out throughout that hour. Now, of course, they don't know that, and we don't know that, and the ride operators don't know that, and the cast members don't know that. It's completely random. It's a fluke when that happens. But you can imagine when you go to get in the standard queue and all of a sudden a couple hundred extra lightning lane people come and get into their queue, they're going to speed that side of it up and they're going to take more people in the lightning lane in order to get them through the ride. So because of that, the highest ratio, because we have confirmed this, the highest ratio they will take at any of the rides is 10 to 1, meaning they will take 10 lightning lane pass holders to one traditional person in the queue. So you can imagine they could put 100 lightning lane people through and only 10 people in the traditional queue. And if the lightning lane keeps filling up that line, the traditional queue is never going to move. It'll take forever. And in fact, this last summer, my worst experience when it was way over was at the Kilimanjaro Safaris at Animal Kingdom. The wait time was advertised at 60 minutes. It was the only ride we hadn't done. And we decided, okay, we can wait 60 minutes. We want to go do this. We were there with some friends. And when we got into the line, we obviously started our timer. We knew what time we got in and we did not get on the ride until 90 minutes. So it took us an hour and a half to get onto the ride. And when we got up to the front, I asked the cast member there, Hey, this is taking a lot longer than what you guys advertised out front. And they said, we know we were told to go to 10 to one on our lightning lane queue. And I said, even then at 10 to one, you should probably back that down to probably four to one or five to one just for the next 10 or 15 minutes to get people through the standard queue because we're waiting much longer than what you guys had advertised. And at that point in time, they changed it to 120 minute wait time. So we were better than the 120, but obviously worse than the 60 when we got into the queue. They, of course, do the best that they can to adjust it, but it was because so many people were coming through with the lightning lane. That to me is the one big flaw with the lightning lane is the fact that they give them an hour window for a reservation and they're trying to gauge when people are going to come and they do their best. What they should probably do is back that down to 15 minutes or 30 minutes for a window and force the people using the lightning lane to, hey, this is your time period. This is it. You get one shot at this. It's 15 minutes. It's 30 minutes for you to get in there. And that way they can be more predictive with how many people are coming through the uh, queue and they can adjust that wait time accordingly, right? Based on how many other people are out there. So of course, Disney's only concerned about giving their Lightning Lane uh, purchasers the best experience possible because they want them to keep buying it. And then for everyone else in the general queue, they want you to start buying it. So, of course, they're going to get preferential treatment there. But I do think that there's a better way to do it and to be more fair to the general queue people that are out there. Second tip is rides with a continuous load. And by continuous load, it's on a conveyor belt. As people walk on, they're able to get onto the ride. The perfect example, both East Coast and West Coast, is Ariel's Undersea Adventure. So at Magic Kingdom out in Orlando and then at California Adventure out in Anaheim, they have the Ariel uh, Little Mermaid ride. Both of them are identical to one another, and the ride format is a continuous load, which means you are walking along the conveyor belt as you get in and out of the cars. Same thing works for the Haunted Mansion. Now, the one difference on the Haunted Mansion is they have to take you in the elevator or in the pre-show room to get you to that place in line. Because of that, that could throw it off just a little bit. But for the most part, that's also continuous load ride. Continuous load rides are more easily to predict how long it's gonna take because they continuously move. They know exactly how many cars are gonna go through by hour. Now, if you take another ride out there, so anything like a Toy Story Midway Mania, which is at both coasts, or the Tower of Terror out in Orlando, which is Mission Breakout out at California Adventure in Anaheim. Those rides, uh, they have to load each car, right? So if it takes people a little bit longer to get off and on, or if uh, there's something that breaks down or malfunctions, which actually I have been on the Tower of Terror when the elevator piece of it malfunctioned, 
and we got stuck. So that was a very unique experience. But yeah, rides like that are going to take a little bit longer to load and unload. And those ones are a little bit more unpredictable. So those ones are going to be a little bit less accurate when it comes to wait time. Okay. Over at Universal, let's hop over. This is the big difference is over there. They obviously have Express Pass, but you are not required to make reservations for the ride. And because you're not required to make those reservations, it is a complete crapshoot when anyone's going to go get in line. So whether you're doing the Incredible Hulk ride or you're doing Escape from Green Gots, you never know how many people are going to be in that queue or how many people are going to be going towards that queue at that point in time during the day. So because of that, those times can be highly unpredictable. They can swing very quickly in either direction. Okay. So that's why I say Universal. Single rider is your best bet. There are a ton of single rider queues at Universal. And that is going to be the best way to reduce your wait time in any of the queues out there to use single rider. So one of the big differences there, but both parks use wait times as a psychological tool. So case in point, we've talked about how the Haunted Mansion did it and they said it was a 90 minute wait there over at Universal. We went there over the 4th of July weekend and the ride that we wanted to rope drop was Hagrid's motorbike. And when we were at Islands of Adventure and went to go get on Hagrid's motorbike, the people holding up signs for the queue said the wait time is going to be 240 minutes. And the queue was all the way over in the Lost Continent over by the Mythos restaurant. And so if you're familiar, that's a very long queue. There's no question that queue is astronomically long. But at the same time, we knew it wouldn't be 240 minutes. There's no way it's going to be a four-hour wait to get on Hagrid's motorbike. And don't get me wrong. I know opening week... There were some astronomically long lines for Haggard's motorbike, but this is at rope drop. This is first thing in the morning. People are walking very quickly through this queue. We knew that we would be able to get through it much quicker. So in the end, the traditional queue was about 90 minutes long, but they were advertising 240. Okay. The reason they do this is they don't have the queue space for people to wait 240 minutes unless they're weaving them all the way through the park. So psychologically, they're going to tell you it's as long as possible to get people to say, this isn't worth it. I don't want to wait for that. The only people that are going to wait in a line that says 240 minutes are people that know, A, that it's not 240, or B, people that that's the one thing that they want to do that day, and they're willing to give up four hours of their day to go do it. So it's a psychological aspect. Now, another one that we see this happen quite a bit on is over at Epcot at the frozen ride out in the Norway country, that queue, when you go in there, is not very long. There's not a lot of room in there. And because of that, they will continually bump that wait time up to 60, 90 minutes just because there's no room in that queue for more people. So again, psychologically, they're telling you, go somewhere else, go do something else. And then when it goes down, we will drop the wait time. And then that's a good time to go back in there. We went on that again at the 4th of July holiday and the queue told us that it was a 60 minute wait and we got in and we were on in 15 minutes. And it's just because inside of that room, there's just not a lot of queue space. So if the queue's never outside the door, know that your wait time's probably not going to be much longer than about 45. That's the longest we've ever waited. And the queue was right up to the door. So we got in line right then and there were tons of lightning lane people coming in and it took us 45 minutes. So if it's not outside the door, chances are you're not going to be longer than 45 minutes over there. But again, psychologically, they're going to tell you it's 90 to keep people from getting into that queue. What we found are the ones with the shorter queue, like I was just saying with Frozen, are the ones that are always by far the most exaggerated wait times. So Frozen's a good example. When you look across the rest of Epcot, you've got other queues that like three caballeros over in Mexico, that can only hold probably 50 people in that entire queue. So anytime you see that wait time bump up, it's usually going to be the line, the queue has gone into the main pavilion there inside of Mexico, inside of the Mayan ruin there. And they're trying to keep everybody out of that line. They don't want people to go there. So they're going to bump it up. Likewise, Small World over in Fantasyland, Peter Pan in Fantasyland, Adventures of Winnie the Pooh over in Fantasyland at Orlando. Those queues are not very long. Now in Anaheim, the Winnie the Pooh queue is a little bit longer, as are the other Fantasyland queues where they zigzag back and forth. And those ones are all slower load rides. Those are not on a conveyor belt. They click through. They do them one car at a time. Those ones do take a little bit longer. So in Anaheim, they're a little more accurate. In Orlando, they can be a little bit exaggerated. 
When you're out in Anaheim, though, think about Fantasyland. The queues there, obviously, uh, they're longer than Orlando, but they're not very long compared to Indiana Jones, which probably has one of the longest queues I've ever been in. You can take just as long walking through the queue as what the wait time could potentially be. And they obviously built that ride in such a way that they knew there'd be a lot of demand. And the queue is extensively long inside the temple. Outside of the temple, it zigzags a whole bunch if they get all the queue space opened up. But that's one that they know they can hold a ton of people in. So that one, Indiana Jones, is going to be more accurate than some of the others because they know they have the space. They're not worried about playing the psychological game with you. Okay, so big difference there is do they have the queue space? So anytime you're thinking about is this wait time accurate or not? One thing I want you to think about and ask yourself is how long is the queue for that ride? If that queue is long, chances are it's pretty accurate. If it's not long, chances are it's not accurate. They're trying to keep people out of that queue. So some tips and tricks that we have when dealing with wait times at the parks. Okay, number one, of course, out of the gate, and we say this on all the episodes, use single rider. If your kids are over the age of 10 and you can use single rider, go to there. You're going to be a lot quicker than any of the wait times that are posted out there for the most part, with the exception of two seated roller coasters like the Rock and Roller Coaster or Expedition Everest. Though Expedition Everest, the single rider queue is hidden. That definitely helps over there. But use single rider whenever you can. When you're looking at the My Disney Experience app or you're looking at the Universal app, If you see an area of the park has a lower wait time, which this happens quite a bit over at Hollywood Studios, at Epcot, and at Animal Kingdom, okay? Occasionally, you'll see it happen at Magic Kingdom, though not as often because the park's larger and there are more people allowed in that park. But if you ever see that an area of the park has a lower queue time for multiple rides, obviously, that's a good place to go. You're going to get the shortest wait times. But know that everyone else is going to see that. So they're going to start flooding over there pretty quick. So if you can get there ahead of the crowd, then by all means, go knock out three or four rides in five or 10 minutes each and stay ahead of the crowd. That's a a great way to do it. But everyone's going to go over there. So our I can do this all day tip of the day today is to remember that cute wait times are like gas prices. They go up really fast and they take a long time to come down. Okay, so when you're thinking about it, if you are looking at an area where the queue is only five or 10 minutes long and you're like, let's go, but it's halfway across the park. Trust me, by the time you get there, it's going to be at 20 minutes plus because enough people will see that and flood over there and they're going to get there before you do. Okay, so the queue times will go up quicker than they come down. Conversely, this is probably one of the tips that we've used the most and works really well for us is when you see wait times at one area of the park, and a great area to do this is like Magic Kingdom, when you're looking at Pirates of the Caribbean, Splash Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and potentially even the Haunted Mansion, because all four of those rides are in the same area of the park. When you see that those wait times are really high, start keeping an eye on it. Because remember, like gas prices, they go up fast, they come down slow. So when it's at 60 minutes, and then you see it go down to 45 Chances are is that queue time is getting closer to 30 at that point in time. And again, no one's running over there yet because they still see the 45. That's a good time to start making your way to that side of the park as you see those coming down because they're going to be much, much shorter by the time you get over there. And again, they probably haven't dropped it to its lowest possible potential level yet. So good time to start going over there. Also, The wait times are like uh, supply and demand curves. So if you're familiar with economics, as uh, the supply goes up, so as things are more available, so wait times are shorter, the people are going to start moving in that direction because the cost is lower. The time spent waiting is lower. So people will move in that direction. Then as obviously as wait times go up, people start moving away from that. It's not worth the wait. So what's worth it? And that's the key point of this, of the supply and demand curve. When you're at Epcot, for example, and Ratatouille has a 20-minute wait, being one of the newest rides at Epcot, that is an incredibly short wait for Ratatouille is 20 minutes, okay? Supply and demand. That means that the, the, the demand's not very high right now. We're dropping the wait time down. It's at 20 minutes. Now everyone's gonna run over there. Okay. And within a couple minutes, that wait time is going to jump right back up to 45 minutes or an hour. 
Conversely, if you go and look at living with the land over in the land pavilion next to Soren, that wait time may only be five minutes. Okay. Not a lot of people love living with the land. So if it's at five minutes and people flock over there, it's not going to get longer than 15. Okay. So that's the supply and demand curve you need to think about. What is the demand for that ride? For living with the land, the demand's not very high. So it's probably never going to get above 15 minutes for the wait. With Ratatouille, the demand's very high. So the second that wait time drops, it's going to bounce right back up real quick. So you want to watch for when that wait time starts to shrink. Or our next strategy is do it at rope drop. Anytime you can do a ride at rope drop, you are going to have a shorter wait at rope drop first thing in the morning than you will probably any other time of day for probably any ride that's out there. So at rope drop, you're going to want to go tackle that. Now, we will have episodes on rope drop strategies for each of the parks. But we will be getting to the rope drop episodes here shortly. But when you look at that, there are ways to shorten your wait time based on what order you ride rides in. Again, none of it's going to beat single rider. So that is by far the best tool that you can use um, across the board at any of the parks. Unfortunately, Disney doesn't have it at all their parks, but Universal does. So Universal is a great place to use the single rider lines and avoid those longer queues. And at the same time, maximize your time in the parks. So with that, we wish you a magical week this week. Next time you go to Disney, take a look at that Disney experience app or at Universal, their app. Watch those ride times. Use some of the strategies we talked about today. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.